about that. Got cut off again. I'll make this last one brief. Um, I was talking about how the social psycholinguistic view of reading as regards to syntax is the way I see it, it kind of creates readers and I guess writers that are more flexible with their understanding of language. They're able to, this is a quote from the book, morphologically categorize upcoming words or new words um, based on their knowledge of syntax. So uh, I used this example earlier, but if they see hoping, uh, if they've studied syntax, they would perhaps be able to say, oh, it, it has the root word hope, I see H-O-P, so I know it's not hopping, it's, uh, or maybe they wouldn't be able to eliminate that right away, but they would be able to say, oh, it looks like hope, hoping. Um, it, it, to me, this seems like it would create more flexible readers, which is only a good thing. Um, yeah, moving on to the last part that I thought was really important was the uh, relation between second language teaching and syntax, specifically teaching English as a second language and how is syntax related to that. Two ways of teaching it, again, first one uh, is called ALM, Audio Lingual Method. This uh, is, what this means is dialogues and drills to help students learn English sentence patterns. Um, it seemed pretty, see now I feel like a bad teacher, because I was reading it, I was like, oh yeah, this is, I should, you know, incorporate some of this into my, you know, daily pedagogy, and then like the next paragraph is like, wrong, <laughs> it's like, this is not, this is not preferred pedagogy, I'm like, all right, fine. Um, Freeman and Freeman say it's basically not, uh, it is pretty much devoid of meeting, meaning, excuse me, and it gives little attention to, yeah, to meaning and context. It's things like, you know, I say, this is a pencil. And the class says, that is a pencil, which is great. It's teaching you structures of, typical structures of English language, but it doesn't, it's kind of out of context, is, is their beef with it, which is legit. Um, again, the way kids improve their language is by saying things like, I go to the store. They're using uh, patterns that they've seen and heard before, and they're synthesizing them, they're applying them to what they know, and they're, you know, uh, circumnavigating, they're kind of getting there towards the, the correct version of English. But they don't, that's not the way kids learn languages, just by like, I heard it, so I'm going to say it that way, or else a kid would never say, I goad, because adults don't talk that way, they never say that. Um, so, the, what I can only assume is the preferred way, and now that I read that one, I'm like, okay, I do that too. Uh, the content-based language teaching. So this is where you're teaching language within the context of social studies or science or math or any content area. Um, big, big important thing here is to make your linguistic input, input comprehensible. Um, it's theme-based curriculum, so you're teaching language through the content. Again, it's much more meaningful because there is a, a definite context for it. And what ends up being great about this is it gives kids lots more exposure to academic language. And it just so happens that academic language is complex language with things like a lot more passive voice and a lot more complex verb constructions. Uh, so it's more challenging and it's more, as we know, kids through being exposed to challenging content grow more. So that's all I have. I'm going to cut it off because I know this has been a long one, but I look forward to seeing your feedback and... Um, discussing some of this stuff with you guys in the message boards. Thanks.